We start with light. I won't go into the drug use of opium, but I will say fundamentally it is the primary material of architecture. And shadow, which comes with it, is its second. And I put a picture of the little prince here. You've all probably read it. If you haven't read it, you must. Because on one of the planets that the little prince visits is a reverbère, that's a French word. It's the lamplighter. And the planet spins very, very fast. So he, the time he's lit the lamp, he has to put it out. But at least he has a job. So he gets 1,440 sunsets every day, every 24 hours. But he's cool. He's cool about it. And he's never had to change what he's done or what he's doing. But that's a tragedy. Because he's very faithful, but he's very unhappy. Because he's the only person on his planet. And his job doesn't give him any rest. Could be describing an architect student. This, if you can see it, is the Earth in about 1800. A few gas lamps, a few bonfires, maybe a volcano. And this is today. Are we all now lamplighters? And is being a lamplighter our problem of our planet today? When looking at something like light, there are, have been and are artists who go to the nth degree of perception, the boundary of what we can actually understand in terms of light and the way we see. James Turrell is one. Architects turn up. And we were looking at the moon, or the sky, or the stars. But today, because of too many lamplighters, we don't see the sky as well. We have to go well into the countryside, into the mountains, to see the stars and the moon. And you have a different perception of light and shadow. And in many ways, this is the architecture I deplore. I cannot understand it at all. There is no architecture here. But in nature, we find another level of light. These are fireflies. And you can go to somewhere in Mexico now, and it's become a, a real haven for visitors. And it's changed the economy of this area, the firefly. And that's one on somebody's finger. So I got interested many years ago in bioluminescence. And it's out there, and it's interesting. And if you could imagine, sorry, go back one. If you could imagine that in those beautiful parks, like Articella in those valleys, instead of using lights, we could use mold or animals or plants to light the paths. It's a different way of looking at perception of light. And you would read that light as you're walking along. Shadow. This drawing from 1617, it's an etching by Robert Flood, is about infinity. Be sick in infinitum. 300 years later, we all know about Malevich's black square. So things have been around a long time that we forget. And lost knowledge is like lost shadows. We don't look at shadows enough. And if you look at somebody like Sina, Sinan, Mima Sinan, who to me is probably the greatest architect I know in terms of his work, was also an engineer, hydraulic engineer, structural engineer, could design boats and bridges and understood light and could conduct water in different ways, both domestically and at a city scale. All he introduces here in this bathhouse is the idea of stars. And we can look at the great Gothic architecture, Ark and Cathedral on the left, where almost all of the stone is taken away for glass. And on the right, you have Sinan doing the same sort of thing. Does anybody know where this is? Yeah, Sagrada Familia. And what's nice is it's going to be finished within the next 10 years. But 
in a way, this represents a beauty that we can all recognize, and yet it's static and it's not pure nature. Do you know why they don't have any f flying arches? I don't know the word in Italian. The arch? Yeah, there aren't any here. And does anybody know why? Parabolas. The forces of a parabola in compression don't require lateral stability. And this is a simple, musical, beautiful musical composition by Gaudi of that. Marco mentioned earlier that I reckon around 12% of shadow against the sky, any more than that, you start to have a heavy structure. Nothing wrong with heavy structures. But if you're trying to design a light one, you have to try and get to that level. And this was a drawing I did of Leipzig Glass Hall. And now I have a break for four minutes whilst you watch a movie. Worth adding, this building is 21 years old and it looks like it was built yesterday. Now this is German, keeping buildings clean and well maintained. But they have two robots. It's 250 meters long, that's two and a half football pitches, and 80 meters wide, and about 30 meters high. That's 350,000 cubic meters of air. You might wonder where the heat comes in winter when it's minus 10 outside. It comes from where the people's feet are. It only relates to where people can be. It does have a function. It's the entrance hall. It's where you can buy a ticket, go to the bathroom, get food, buy books. And the central area where you can see four towers is where they have things like boxing matches, uh, singers, music. And the space has a reverberation time of 35 seconds. So if you go, You've got it for 35 seconds. Audible. So the whole envelope is suspended from the structure is 16 millimeters thick, two layers of glass. Both toughened so that if one breaks, the energy release will not break the other one. And when they put the robots on, for the first time they dropped one. And it broke a sheet of glass on the outside. And the client was delighted that two months later, when they got the replacement panel, nothing had changed. It was still there. Thank goodness. Okay, now we're going on to nonlinear beauty.
from that sequence of just pictures, movies of nature, you may have noticed um, there is a natural beauty, if you or I can see it. Just out of curiosity, and it's not to be naughty or anything, is there anybody out there that didn't find those films representing nature very beautiful? Is there anybody out there that doesn't agree with that beautiful? Right. So the theory is non-linear. You cannot predict the behavior of where the leaf is going to go or the light reflecting on the water or the candle flame, how it's going to move. Maybe with all the biological computers in the future, we may be able to predict the weather patterns much better, but we won't be out there trying to prove the next leaf fall on some park like Articella. So that beauty, that notion of beauty will remain with us. What happens when you design something as an artist, a sculptor, or an architect, or an engineer? Okay. You start looking at making sure the building won't fall down, people will be safe. You start analyzing the structure. You start composing it with other elements. And every time you do that, you are taking away the non-linearity. In a way, it's not quite the unpredictability, but it's sort of, that nature has given you to start with. So if you're doing a painting and you start with a line on the painting, you're beginning to structure something on that piece of paper. And in poetry and music, architecture, engineering, structure, rhythm, harmony, they all come into play. But each one of those is a way of defining something that our mind is trying to create. I mean, in many ways, we're trying to replicate something to do with the beauty of nature. Because if we weren't, then things could get very ugly. And in the history of art and architecture, things have occasionally gone wrong because we've lost touch with nature. And I think it wasn't his fault, but it was people who followed him. But Descartes, who separated body from mind or body from brain, actually gave us dominion over nature in theory. And that has brought us to the crisis of Extinction Rebellion and others today. In the last 30, 40 years, certainly in the work we've done and what I write about is bringing the synthesis back, synthetic thinking at every level, but particularly in relationship to how we extract, how we make things, and that relationship back to the Earth. And I wrote an economic theory for Columbia University 20 years ago. I'll just give you the title, because you'll understand from the title what it's about an alternative, altruistic, competitive economy. Human beings compete. You can't take that away from us. But the beneficiary should be the planet. And we could have a flip, a complete flip, on the industrial scenario that we have in the 21st century. This building, Lavalette, which Marco mentioned, had the, the invention of the glass fixing, structural glazing. And it went around the world amongst architects and engineers like measles, like this disease. And glass became the answer. But what was the question? Nobody was asking the real questions in their own projects. It was just easy to copy. But this structure that you can see, can you imagine that that plane of glass, which is 32 meters by 32 meters, made out of sheets, receives all the wind load and it bends? But there's no stress in the glass because of the bearing and the fixing. But what it does is it pushes the structure out of its geometry. So this structure here, all of this lot, bends inwards like an elastic band. The fact that when the wind drops off, it restores itself is the first time that nonlinearity has been brought to solid state materials. If it didn't restore itself, it would not be nonlinear. But the fact it can go outside of its geometry completely and still be stable is this characteristic. So that is rarely, talk, rarely talked about because people don't understand that bit. It's very difficult to explain. It's true. Are you in control? I won't dwell on this because otherwise I'd go on forever. Next one. This one on the same period as the Lavalette was to explore uh, the three-dimensional equivalent of lasers. 
Now, lasers came from masers, which were kind of invented around the 1940s, early 50s. And nobody quite knew what they would do with this thing, this dot that went off into infinity, carrying energy or what, or information. This society in the world today cannot exist without lasers. I had the daft idea that maybe three-dimensional light, if we can make forms, actually create forms, we can actually create new ideas for maybe energy transfer, carrying three-dimensional information in a different way. So this is in a vacuum tube at 0.2 millibars. There's an anode and a cathode and 20,000 volts are let free in the void. And by changing the shape of the anode, you can, oh, you can create these bird forms and rings. I don't know what, it will hap what will happen to this idea, but it exists. And nobody can actually work out what's quite happening at the plasma level yet. And that's 25, 35, oh gosh, 35 years ago. Next one. You're in charge. Yeah. Shadows. <coughs> at La Villette, at uh, the Louvre, we did these sculpture courtyards. Fundamentally, light comes in. It's going to hit something called a structure. And that structure is going to cast a shadow. And you really don't want sharp lines on the shadows. The man on the left is Monsieur D'Alembert. He was the co-author of the first universal encyclopedia with Diderot. But nobody has ever heard of him since. I won't go into his life, which is fascinating. But in the book in the middle, Dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des métiers, he talked about three things of the human mind. Imagination, memory, and reason. And those three can be, the, if you like, the titles in your library. And every book will fit those three things. Every title. However, he's also wrote a, bit, a little paper on shadow. And it's about the size of an object between the light source and what it's going to hit. And you can calculate how big an element you can have to ensure you get penumbra. In other words, not sharp shadows. Okay. Yeah. So these are the courtyards. Next. And here are two designs. One which you can see was dated 1985, which was based on our work at La Villette, which has no frame. The, the, these elements here are points every two meters, say. So they're not really a problem. This tube is, and that's the maximum size we could go to, which is 150 millimeter diameter, in order not to have sharp shadows on the sculptures below. And you can see the width of that shadow line. Mr. Pay didn't believe this could work. So they insisted on aluminum extrusions. So we had to redesign it like this. We didn't want to. And I also said it will leak, which it did because it's very difficult to do an aluminum structure that's expanding and contracting that doesn't have the same coefficient of expansion as glass. So there's the width. Next. Here come the shadows. Next. We won't dwell on this because Marco's explained that one already. Except I will say one thing. What the man is looking at is the most touched space of nothingness in Paris. Everybody puts their finger through it. And why? Da Vinci Code. Oh, Leonardo again. Yeah. They made a movie. Next slide. And there he is, standing, sitting on top of the inverted pyramid. What's important here is that the edges of the glass were chamfered at 45 degrees to create these rain rods. We didn't call them rainbows because they were straight lines. So this is a clock. This is telling you you are spinning, although you don't know how fast you're spinning or at what speed you're traveling through the universe. But it's something like 300,000 kilometers an hour, but you don't feel it. Next. And then we experimented with Pilkington to provide a coating for artists or graffiti artists to be able to write on glass with light. And the image you can do will last maybe 20 minutes and then fade away. 
This was installed in an exhibition, a light landscape exhibition in Ingolstadt in Germany in 1992. You entered a black tunnel, and often the lamps that you could write with didn't work because the old people opened them up to take the batteries out. <laughs> Next. I won't dwell on this other than what Marco said. It's the beginnings, real beginnings, of looking at materials that didn't and don't need any maintenance whatsoever. Next. Fiber optics, probably the single or the most elegant and brilliant invention of a material that man has so far produced. And what's also interesting, and you can see it here, is you can put it into a cable. This is the fiber optic going down the middle. But then you can also, next slide. No, okay. Sit, stay there. It's all right. It's fine. What you can also do is put fiber optics into cables that carry electrical power. This is a wee fountain, which, of course, has a bit of fiber optics <laughs> pumping light out. And what's interesting is if you take a tap and you let the water do this and you put a torch or a lamp at the end of it, you'll see the water conduct light. And that was the first thought of somebody in the West about, ah, water could carry information. And then somebody took a, a bow, one of these bows, and melted some glass on the end of the arrow and fired it into the sky. And in the speed of release, it left a trail of fibers, glass fibers. And that was the beginning of the water and the glass creating fiber optics. Next. So this is Alba di Milano. Yeah. <coughs> the design, the poetic design, was simply making a statement with a piece of cloth. This is the world center of fashion and cloth making. But there is no center. And this is, if you like, the emergence of the influence of the internet upon everybody. Nobody's in control. Except, <coughs> back then in 2000, we didn't realize that people like Google and Facebook would turn up. But interestingly, their whole systems are based on algorithms. And I know people who can write algorithms to destroy Facebook and Google and give it back to you. And that might happen in the next five years. So all that concern about social media and fear of loss of information, knowledge about yourself can actually be flipped just, just like the economy. So this was just the mock-up that lives in my garden at home. It's a tenth scale mock-up. It was about 300 square meters. It was in front of a Tocha main railway station um, for 18 months and then mysteriously disappeared. Mr. Scarby, I think it was. Okay. Okay, next. Yeah. So in the bottom right-hand corner, this is just here, um, high power, 400,000 volts being conducted. This is the power game across Europe. The electricity is bought, sold, and transferred in both directions through cables. But in the middle of those, you can actually put fiber optics. So there's a whole network sitting there that is not really exploited yet, although there are some kilometers of it in Europe. Next. Won't dwell on this one. Other than to say, the people in Dublin, because they are very literate, they love language and writing, so they came up with names for this. The first name was the Stiletto in the Ghetto. There were some very sexy ones, like the erection at the intersection. For me, it was called um, Celestial Acupuncture. So you're like scratching clouds, the light, to conduct the light down, not as a mirror, a polished surface, but as a soft surface <coughs> that picks it up. At night, because the way the surface has been treated, the stainless steel, which you can see in the bottom right, has been bombarded by stainless steel balls. The result is you get many, many, many uh, facets, if you like, of... Uh, depressions and those facets are like velvet so the spire at night goes darker than the sky by a long way because it keeps 
absorbing in a way, even though it's metal, light stops it going around and coming out so quickly. Next. That's a film. And again, water. This is actually a big structure, and a lot of water comes down. And there are two things that happen. One, you can watch the flow of water, <coughs> which is just something natural whilst you're waiting for your boyfriend or your partner to turn up. And the women in Dublin do use the polished bits to put their lipstick back on. So when the water gets to the bottom of the spire and goes into the drainage below the ground, it joins lots of tops of lipsticks. <laughs> Next. Okay. It should be mo a movie. No, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. But this is at the very small scale of thinking about your building or your design in a poetic way that you actually realize that when it rains, it could be interesting just the same way that when the cloud or the light goes past, there's something's going to happen, and a way of capturing it. Next. Okay. I'll mention this. Dublin doesn't allow aeroplanes to fly over. However, they have one helicopter for the police. And so we had to put a 2,000 candela light at the top. Nobody in that time had ever made anything over 500 lux in an LED. So that was pure research with Philips and Lumiled, well, a company called Lumiled in California, which was Hewlett Packard with Philips. And eventually, three years later, we could bring the light down and put the one up, the big one. <coughs> Next. But the light is not direct. It's very high up, and you just see it off the surface. Like when you're looking into your partner's eyes, it's actually the eye, the eyelid that's very important. Next. And of course, the city changes its color. And in a way, it's a contradiction to something I said earlier, but there's a little bit of light at the top, but the moon is not hurt <coughs> too much. Next. And we set up a trust to help fund children in Dublin or in Ireland to get access to the arts. And we designed a candle made in Denmark. And that candle burns for six hours, very beautifully. But you can see how a simple idea like a line, the first line on the left was the etching. And that was the first line. And that's all that we did at the beginning to design this monument. Next. And next. A sundial that's the opposite of an equatorial sundial. It's reversing it because the ring normally is just a half ring at the bottom, actually goes all the way over. So the ring casts a shadow on the gnomon. So the gnomon can be telling the time. Yes, show you. See the shadow here? And this is related to spring through to autumn, and of course winter. Next. And being aware of a tree, one tree in an urban condition, or the idea to plant a tree to create shadow. Next. Suddenly, the whole building changes, and it will change during the evening and throughout the year. Next. But it's a conscious decision. We also designed a lamp with Ulrika Brandy, which we call Zebedee, because Zebedee and the Magic Roundabout always said it's time for bed. So it folds away and goes to bed. But you have a moon and a sun, and it's the first was was the first LED where you can change the color temperature from very cold or down to one lux or one candle. Next, contradiction complete. We're about to install quite a few hundred of these in a project in Malta, where we've got rid of the high intensity that you often get from uplighters. Up we've actually flattened it out. Next. Birds, seaside, gulls, they shit. <coughs> so when they fly past this building, which is made of woven bronze, the guano, is the correct word, lands on the bronze, the phosphor bronze, and interacts with the copper. And you get a painting happening. You get golds and greens and not quite reds. This is Jackson Pollock, for real, done by birds. 
because Jackson Pollock was the first painter only to use gravity. A simple principle of gravity. He just held a brush and let it drop. No artist ever thought of doing that before. However, the birds have been doing it for a long time, but it's just we did not notice. However, we did here. Next. Next. And you can see, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Gabion, which Marco mentioned. Of course, the thing about the Gabion is it gets inhabited by all sorts of insects, small rats, even birds make nests. So that wall will be an ever-changing wall. Next. And the lake, that's a film. I think. I think. Yeah. The stillness of a lake accentuated by simply having a little bit of movement running alongside it. Dead flat, a new fixing, because we didn't want in this landscape the idea that this was really a building. So when you look down on it, it looks like a lake, and when you're looking up at it, as you saw in the previous picture, it just looks like a wall, which is what it is. Next. Coming to the end. This neuroscience building, the facade, <coughs> because we designed it with uh, a sinusoidal profile, very fine, two millimeters, it means you've got a million downpipes, rainwater pipes. So you don't need to clean it because exaggerating that profile, the top, bits of wind will blow the dirt off into the valleys and the water will conduct the dirt away in the valley. So there's no maintenance cradles, there's no kit, which you'll find that some of the more archi most architects and most commercial buildings always have something on the top. Trouble is you can't see through it. It's translucent and lets through about 300 lux, through at the back, four meters back. So we asked the scientists, neuroscientists, do you want windows or not in a conference? And five out of 500, but we took a vote, and it was 249 to 251 in favor of windows. This is secret research. And the ones against windows were afraid that things like would jump out the window and kill somebody outside. So they got windows. <coughs> and you can sort of see them. And they've got blinds uh, shading on them. Next. And you can see some of them are now opening. But what's nice is they have a choice. It's difficult for the environmental engineers, the mechanical engineers, because we've now got two systems. You're air-conditioned, and you've got opening windows. And there's a third one, which is to do with the laboratories, which has their own air supply. So you'd think this be a building that's going to absolutely guzzle energy. Nah. Because it's just like an ordinary building. We put in sensors to sniff out anything that was dangerous in the ducts in the air supply. And as soon as there is, it goes up to 12 air changes per hour. Otherwise, it runs at two and a half, just like anywhere else. Next. What's also interesting, it's a white building in the day, and it's a white building at night. And if you ever look at buildings at night in the city, all you see are the light fittings. And interestingly, in the daytime, most windows are very dark gray or even black. And that's why our cities are quite tough. But there may be a way of re-looking at that, I think. Next. This is the other side of the building. It conceals plant and kit. But it's interesting. Next. It's a film. Because the wind blows. So that just is a wall <coughs> that's concealing, that's just changing all the time. Next. Okay. So this element and other elements of the light and the way it performs, and including this one, is getting back to that unpredictability being expressed. So the one is with wind, another one is with projection, another one is the behavior of human beings in the building. Do you want to run the film? Film. <laughs> So it's a bit like a metaphor for the brain, like a neural network. Next. Royal Academy of Music, inside a violin. Now, if that's not architecture, I don't know what is. It's perfect. Next. So we designed 
essentially the last instrument from the voice that starts somewhere down in your stomach. And you can go online and see all the muscles and all the chambers that are involved in producing sound. We don't hear it until it's got into space. And so this is the last instrument. And this is where wood entered into my life. Next. <coughs> Next. And this is just another three or four minutes. Have I got three or four minutes? Yeah? yeah. yeah? Of course. With this is uh, the music arabesque. And what's nice is it's played by... I haven't actually quite finished with no, 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 no. Anyway, so Arthur Seller, this is a very nice, and Marco, who made it, engineered it, along with his brother, <laughs> uh, sitting in the front row. I think it was challenging. Uh, the outcome is fantastic. Uh, it surprised everybody, because if you take anti-clastic curvature, uh, a saddle, yeah, you're familiar with this shape? Hyperbolic parabolas? Yes? Good. Right? It's like a saddle on a horse. The valley, Articella, <coughs> it's a saddle. So that was the inspiration. Very simple. However, because we've got into weaving, whether it's phosphor bronze or other materials, the idea of weaving wood seemed a quite a natural idea. Now these should have been perfect anti curvatures. However, 
That, if they had been circular sections of wire or cable, would have been perfect. However, because we used wood and we used this Italian red oak, six centimeters wide, a centimeter thick, that section and that wood transforms the geometry that you've designed or you think you've designed. And it, nature, and that section and what we made as a decision distorted the perfect anticlastic curvatures and produced something very beautiful. And that kind of accident I kind of like, I have to say. Next. So it's almost like a hat. <coughs> And because we had originally designed this to hang from a tree, if you imagine flipping this one over that one, you'd end up with two curves. <coughs> and you could put a ball in between, three meter diameter, and it would be an eye. And we started with the thought of an eye of cellar. Unfortunately, last October, last October, a year ago, a very famous tornado ripped up through the valley from the Mediterranean for the very first time and took down, down 12 million trees. So <coughs> Emanuele Montebella, the director said, mm, Ian, no in the trees, huh? <laughs> it may not last. But the idea was that the trees moving would move the eyeball. But the stream appeared, which was very nice. Next. 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 Film. Film. It's back again, looking at something. And of course, the shadow is not stable because it's moving, although you can't see it because the time frame in our, for our brains is too slow. Next. So there he is. The lamplighter's back. And the lamplighter's taught me a new lesson. Saint Exupéry, what he wrote, uh, is actually quite philosophical. Next. Final film for you. Nothing to do with me. It's uh, Hani Yappi. He's a Danish artist. good <laughs> okay you know that oil is lighter than water simple idea set fire to it but it embodies the two concerns about the climate we have today carbon and rising sea level and is the rising sea level due to what most people get give the wrong answer Anybody got any idea why the sea's rising? No, nope. everybody's scared to answer now. Huh? Yeah. No, that's the normal answer. It's because the air temperature, and therefore the temperature of the sea, is getting higher, and water expands. That's what's causing the sea to rise. The fact that it melts a few glaciers is relatively incidental. So it's the air temperature is the problem. You don't believe me? Think, of, think about the laws of physics. <laughs> so <coughs> I end with a simp simple notion. Maybe we should just put out the lights a bit more, an awful lot more. Next. Okay. Yeah, so that's my theory. and. Next slide. Thank you very much. If you want, to, next slide. I, yeah. If you want to buy the book of the thinking, <laughs> this is a book on poetry about the work. This is the autobiography. This is Alessandro's book. And I point this one out. I was asked to contribute and inform quite a lot of the text in this book, designing the profile of the future architect. And since that's where you're going to be. It's available from Share, and it has a hundred architects, quite well known, some of them, contributing their thoughts about what is the future profile 
of an architect. Thank you very much.